Hi and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on blue biomass feed and food production for clear water and blue biodiversity. And thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Marin Linksgaard. I'm a marine biologist working with the WSP. And first of all, I just like to mention some house rules. Uh, we will have time for questions by the end of this presentation. And also the presentation will be shared afterwards. So please write your questions in the question box and we will take them in the end. So first, uh, I would like to tell you why we think, why WSP thinks that the blue mussel has so much potential and also how we farm the blue mussel in our part of the world. And also talk about one of our projects on industrial production and processing of mussels into fish feed. And then some of uh, on uh, what challenges that we see and how we, um, are working with these challenges and then finally the questions. WSP is a global, global company and with a global company comes global responsibility. Um, and in WSP we are working with our Future Ready Innovation Program uh, which is a global program with the overall goal to future-proof our nature and society. And how does future look? Well, it looks like we're going to be a lot more people on our planet with an ever-growing population. And this, uh, this means that we will have an increasing demand for feed and food, which is putting a pressure on all our natural ecosystems. Um, so, well, uh, we don't get any more resources to our planet. So we need to be really clever about how we manage and use the resources that we have. And with climate change putting in, uh, uh, even more pressure on nature and society, um, this is a really big challenge. And one solution to the challenge is to um, grow some of the food in the ocean in a regenerative way such as the growing of low trophic species such as clams and seaweed. And first of all, uh, the blue mussel is, has a very low carbon footprint. There was made a list in, in Denmark of uh, the carbon footprint of different food items. And some of them are listed here by uh, Concito. And as you can see, the blue mussel has a very low carbon footprint, even lower than the cabbage or carrot or apples. Um, and then the highest footprints come from the beef tenderloin or the minced meat. Uh, and also the mussel meat is very healthy. Uh, it has the bright uh, fatty acids that our brain is dependent on, both for maintenance and development and it has a lot of proteins, minerals and vitamins for our body to work. So uh, this is a good uh, food for us not becoming big muscles and no brain. Um, so uh, it is very healthy and also it contains iron, which is uh, really important for a lot of, especially teenage girl, girls in Denmark. We have one out of six that uh, are suffering from iron deficiency. So if we could just feed our teenagers some more mussels. Um, so is the mussel farming sustainable? Well, talking about sustainability, uh, I always like to go back to the Brundtland report from 1987. And there is, it is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The UN's Food and Agriculture Organization has also defined the climate friendly food to has to have a low carbon footprint and sustainable food if it meets these four requirements, which is protecting and respectful towards the environment, healthy and safe, cultural, acceptable and economically available for all. And so does the blue mussel farming fit into these uh, criteria? Well, it is a local resource, at least in our end of the world. 
and it comes in its own wrapping being the shells so uh, they can actually be kept by five degrees in its in their own shells because they close very effectively for up to two or three weeks um, and it is also a low trophic species uh, which means that you lose very little energy um, because you harvest uh, very low down in the food chain also you don't add anything to mussel farming it's a natural population you don't add any feed or any medicine and it removes the nutrients uh, that are contained inside the mussels and, and shells when you harvest the mussels, which helps clearing the water in, in areas like um, the Danish waters where we have too many nutrients in the water. So uh, are mussel farming sustainable? Well, I guess yes, because it is not compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs because you don't um, compromise the environment while farming it. And also it is healthy and safe it, due to our national food safety systems. It is also cultural acceptable and it is very cheap to buy actually uh, for all. So how do we farm the blue mussels? In Denmark usually we have the traditional way which is farming blue mussels on limes. Uh, loops hanging on horizontal lines and then there is a new or relatively new method uh, increasing in Denmark which is farming mussels on floating tubes and as you can see on the picture on the right hand side here uh, the mussel spat settles on a net which is connected to the tube um, and in Denmark we have a lot of spat and actually the spat covers these nets totally so we need to thin the mussels after a while um, to, to um, nourish the, the last mussels that we want to have on the nets and, and that we want to have the full grow out on. This method uh, demands high investment because you need a lot of machinery, uh, heavy machinery, but you need less man hours. Um, it is high intensity farming because you can have a lot of biomass in the same place. One tube can hold about 25 tons of mussels and you can also harvest very efficiently uh, of up to these 25 tons per half an hour. Um, and also we found that these living reefs uh, it constitutes like a shelter or a habitat for juvenile fish and other marine organisms. So we, um, we did a project, we just finished this project uh, and the project was because of uh, future challenges or current and future challenges with an ever-growing population that is uh, driving an increasing demand for soy meal and fish meal, which again is putting pressure on our natural ecosystems. Um, and also we have way too many nutrients in our oceans and coastal systems because of a very intensive farming. So we wanted to try and get some of these nutrients back onto land. Um, so we wanted to demonstrate a, a full value chain where we have the primary producer being the mussel farmer and then using the mussel meat uh, uh, using that for feed. Some of the small mussels that we are thinning off, we can use for feed. Uh, and then feeding this to agriculture and aquaculture. Um, and then with the waste coming back into the ocean from that, um, that is again taken up by the microalgae or the phytoplankton and then filtrated from the mussels again, um, re, uh, returning into the, into the loop. So demonstrating a full value chain um, and also of course we didn't or WSP didn't want to do the same mistake or support the same mistake as we've been doing on land with uh, a huge industry and farming um, pressuring our natural ecosystem. So we want to keep track on any environmental footprint from upscaling a mussel farm in the ocean. And we finished the project uh, e last year, um, but the whole thing started with a collaboration with the client being the, uh, the blue biomass. Um, 
where we were collaborating on trying to figure out uh, valid business models and funding applications, uh, which led to the first test of a smart farm unit in 2017. In 2018, we got the funding for the full uh, demonstration project. Um, and uh, we have just published the results uh, being a fully operational value chain uh, with muscle meal tested uh, must be used for fish meal and then tested on aquaculture sites. We also demonstrated that it has great potential to remove nutrients from our coastal waters. And this is a really hot topic in Denmark because we have too many nutrients in our coastal waters. And therefore it was uh, in the Saturday news uh, one night that uh, blue mussels can be used as a mitigation tool to remove nutrients. And also one of our results was that we found an increased biodiversity and I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. And so therefore we found it really important to uh, communicate the results in both scientific papers, reports, short movies, media and brochures to stakeholders and decision makers. And the project was done in collaboration with uh, Fish Meal and Fish Oil Fabric, Triple Nine, uh, the Blue Biomass Muscle Farmer, and two different um, universities and funded by, by the Danish Environmental and Food Ministry. So looking at the environmental footprint, uh, first the water column, let me just explain you a bit more about the farm site. Uh, as you can see on the map up here on the left is a map of Europe, pointing out where Denmark is in Europe. I know we have a very international um, audience today uh, in this webinar, so I think maybe not everyone knows where Denmark is. Uh, but here is Denmark, and then this farm site is inside one of our fjord systems on the west side of Denmark. Um, and the mussel farm is our biggest farm in Denmark. Uh, it has potential to produce about 10,000 tons of mussels. It has about 314 tubes um, in an area of 77 acres, where only 13 acres is farmed. It is the smart farm systems from uh, Norway, and it has uh, the potential of filtering a lot of water. One mussel can filter up to seven liters of water per hour, and um, so in 2020, we had about 4,000 tons of mussels with the capacity to filter about 2 million cubic meters of water per hour. As a comparison, our Danish, uh, our largest Danish cleaning facility cleans 41,500 cubic meters per hour. So it's a huge filtering uh, machine. On the right hand side here, you can see a satellite picture which shows that you can see this filtration effect from space. Um, on the left hand side, you can see uh, the colors indicating green where you have a lot of phytoplankton and blue where you have low concentrations of phytoplankton. And on the left hand side was before the farm was established in 2017. And on the right hand side, was when after the farm was established and you can see the difference in the color being blue inside the farm, which means that they reduced the, night, the phytoplankton concentration uh, quite markedly. Looking at the footprint on the sediment floor, um, well, we did expect that because when the mussels are filtrating phytoplankton, uh, a lot of this is, is sedimented out of the mussels as fecal pellets and ending up on the sediment floor. So we did expect an increase in the organic material and nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, we also did expect that we would see an increased oxygen consumption as a result of the increased uh, organic um, enrichment. And then we expected to see less biodiversity under the farm as a result of this uh, organic en enrichment as well. Um, but what we found was an increased amount of nitrogen and phosphorus as was expected. We couldn't see any difference in the oxygen consumption under the farm and compared to reference sites. Uh, what we did find was an increased biodiversity and this was measured with the 
um, B index, uh, which is basically just a, a, a division of different ecological groups. Group one being the group being most uh, sensitive to ecosystem stresses such as nutrient enrichment, and group five being the the, lead, the group um, very uh, very little sensitive to ecosystem stresses. Uh, and we found under the farm we found uh, about 45 percent of the species belonging to ecological group one, which means that this group is very um, intolerant to ecosystem stresses. Also, we found an increased number of species under the farm compared to a reference site. Uh, and this was because that mussels were dripping down from these nets, ending up on the sediment floor, creating a uh, reef underneath the farm. And this reef attracted a lot of different marine organisms, again, uh, being food and feed for, for uh, other uh, marine organisms. Yes, so just a quick look into other uh, challenges that we are working with. Well, one of our challenges is our native bird, the eider duck, and the eider duck really likes mussels. So eider duck predation can be really high um, and they can empty a mussel farm in only a few days. So we've been looking into how to protect mussel farms in a non-harmful way. Uh, and we got funding for a project uh, where we have developed an autonomous vessel for the protection of mussel farms. Um, and that is the small yellow one you can see on your right hand side. The other picture shows the developmental uh, stages in our project where we started with three small boats, one boat and then finally uh, this uh, last very robust boat. And the idea is that this boat can actually be pre-programmed and set off and then it can sail around the farm and then come back, recharge and go out again. Um, and our tests showed that um, with the increasing number of tests we did with the boat, um, the return time of the birds also increased. We did actually expect the birds to get used to the boat, but uh, it was quite the opposite. And this project was done together in collaboration with a co company called Sky Level and a university, and then funded by the Fisheries Fund. And another challenge is that a lot of people living close by the coast in Denmark, and we have a lot of coast, uh, they think it looks ugly to, to, uh, to look out on these uh, farm systems with these floating tubes in the sea surface. So we got funded uh, for a project together with a mussel farmer called Vitrup uh, and some other farmers to, uh, to try and submerge these systems so you cannot see them from the surface um, and then also uh, develop the harvest, underwater harvest and do that using a camera and a sonar system. And we have just submerged the first tubes with great success, uh, which would be this picture just without the tubes in the surface. Uh, and another challenge is that we actually export more than 90% of our great blue mussels in Denmark. So there is a need to, uh, to motivate our Danish mussel market, our Danish market for low trophic species. Um, so we joined another project, which was called Food for Billions, and which was about developing educational material uh, for the school systems. And we developed six different chapters. Um, and within each chapter, there was a movie, a short movie, and then some educational material with questions and assignments. Um, and the overall question was, how can we continue to harvest the ocean in a sustainable way? And will the ocean deliver food for 10 billion people in 2050? This was together with uh, the Danish Pelagic uh, Product Organization and the Marine Ingredients Denmark, Aquaculture Denmark, WSPN and Hedeselskabel. And it was funded by the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. And then again, also working with uh, the Danish market 
um, trying to motivate more Danish people to eat mussels because it is healthy, sustainable, um, and it is a uh, local resource. We also did a cookbook um, uh, with 40 recipes on blue mussels and some science communication about the blue mussel and why it is healthy and sustainable and so on. This was done in collaboration with Miguel Weidemann, who is a specialist in gastronomy and food culture um, and funded by the Hedeselskabet, which is a Danish fund. Um, yeah. So I guess my key message is that the time for blue mussels and regenerative farming is now with the increasing population and a planet where there is no extra resources coming. So we need to be really clever about how we manage the ones we have. And if you need any inspiration on recipes, please let me know, I have a lot. So key messages is that we don't get any extra resources. Um, the mussel farming provides healthy climate and eco-friendly food and feed. The mussel farming has been shown to have a positive impact on the water column clarity and the sediment floor biodiversity. The mussel meal has similar qualities to soy meal and fish meal, so we can use the mussel meal as a substitute and then decreasing the pressure on our natural uh, ecosystems such as the soy production and fish, fish populations. And also uh, we demonstrated that it is quite effective for as a mitigation tool to remove uh, excess nutrients from our coastal ecosystems. The ocean takes up more than 71% of our planet and we rely on the ocean to support a growing population. So let's increase our ocean awareness. And of course, I have not done this on my own, uh, obviously. Uh, so thank you to all my brilliant colleagues out there and the Marine Dream Team um, we have here in my office. So I hope this was informative and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Maren, for a fantastic presentation. So interesting to learn and uh, amazing project projects. Thank you. So I will uh, just mention that you can log your questions in the question box. We have just a few minutes to have a Q&A session and also the presentation is available to download in the handout box. I will start with the first question. Is there an increased amount of organic material under the farm? Sorry, if there is an increased amount of material under the farm, could that lead to poor environmental conditions? And if yes, can this can you tell that it's it is a regenerate regenerating a farm? Yeah, well, it's a good question. Um, but if we start by thinking about the fact that we don't add anything to the system. Um, there will be an increasing amount of organic material under the farm, but that is just an up concentration of organic material from the whole uh, ecosystem or the whole fjord system. So overall, it has a net gain uh, with regards to the environmental status. So it reduces the um, baseline of phytoplankton in the ecosystem in total. Thank you. Why is the mussel meal not already a central, central part of the feed industry and what are the obstacles here? Well, it's still a bit difficult to process the mussels in a cost-effective way, um, but with the future looking at a higher pressure on fish meal, um, the prices will also change. So it's about making the processing cheap enough and the comparable prices on other resources such as soy meal and fish meal. Um, if, if that levels up, then the blue mussels will definitely be uh, a part of the, um, of the feed and food production. Thank you. Is it only in Denmark when, where an increased biodiversity has been found in relation to low tropic aquaculture? Well, it's um, happening all over the world that there is an increased um, attention to this regenerative farming. And there has just been a, published a paper in uh, Review Aquaculture, I think it's called, um, where they analyzed 65 different studies uh, to see if there is any 
a difference in fish and mobile species in farms versus on reference site. And they found uh, that on all the bivalve and seaval, seaweed aquacultures, aquaculture farms, there was an increased amount of uh, species in the aquaculture site. So it's it's a global thing that when you when you farm uh, these low traffic species, it creates a habitat for other marine organisms, resulting in an increased biodiversity. Thank you. Does this project have any impact on local biodiversity? And would sizing up this farm ha has any impact? Well, it's still it's it's um, it's not like a, a general concept that you can just say it, it always creates um, increased biodiversity because with mussel farms, at least in the size that we're working with, it is very important that it is placed in a place where you have a water exchange and uh, if if it's placed inside a closed system, the uh, it would have too much of a up concentration of nutrients for the area to to system or to to carry. Um, so it can increase locally if it's placed right and uh, and you have the right amount of water exchange um, and and also for an upscaling. But all but you always have to look at the um, environment and how this special site is uh, formed and how the ecology is at this site. Thank you. Um, the idea of the uh, cookbook with the 40 recipes on uh, blue mussels, where did it come from? Uh, yeah, that's, a, well, um, I guess we we started working on an idea on how to how can we make blue mussels uh, become like a normal thing to eat in Denmark, um, as normal as chicken or or any other uh, food item that we would like to eat? And then we were working on some kind of um, fast food product that you can take from the freezer and put in the oven. And then brainstorming on how to make a good product, we were like, wow, let's just make a lot of different recipes and and let's make some recipes that are easy to make, uh, that only takes like 10 minutes, and from ingredients that you can always go down in the nearest shop and buy. Uh, so let's make it as easy as possible for people to uh, to make dinner with blue mussels. Fantastic. Thank you. We don't have uh, additional questions, uh, but thank you again for this fantastic uh, presentation. So we are towards uh, now the end of our webinar session. Uh, please feel free to follow up directly with Maren via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining us today. Thank you for your time and thank you, Maren, for your presentation. Thank you.